Hey everybody, Chris Farad here. Welcome to another Codex Entry video for Mass Effect 3. Uh, we have ships, vehicles, technology, reapers, and weapons, armor, and equipment under primary. Uh, planets, ships, technology, reaper war, reapers, and weapon, armor, and equipment on secondary. So, uh, before we go to ships and vehicles over here, we'll do planets and locations on secondary. So, first up is Aea. Humans I detected Aea as an Earth-type world via telemetry in 2165. After probe surveys indicated life, lush vegetation, ample fresh water, and breathable air, the Alliance upgraded the planet to a garden world colonization priority. Interesting. Commanded by Captain Ronald Taylor, the crew of Alliance survey vessel Hugo Gernsback made planetfall in the jungle world in 2173. Soon after, the ship transmissions inexplicably stopped. While the precise fate of the Hugo Gernsback command and crew is unknown, they are presumed killed in action and their vessel destroyed. Well, that didn't work out well. Pharos is a habitable world in the Attican Beta Cluster. Two-thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean Megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. The Pioneer Settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. Freedom's Progress Freedom's Progress Colony was only a typical Alliance settlement. Oh, was was once a typical Alliance settlement, but following complete communications blackout and its apparent destruction is now a lightning rod for anxiety and dread in the galactic human community. The communications blackout followed an upgrade of the colony's small military force supplemented by mechs and security drones with high-power tower-mounted Guardian lasers. Colonists complained about construction cost overruns, delays, noise, and damage to the local environment. They also feared that the defense array could be seen as provocative to their world's neighbors. Such fears may not have been baseless. Authorities still have, have still offered no explanation for the communications blackout, fueling rumors of plagues, natural disasters, or a cult-inspired mass suicide. Interesting. Located in strategically insignificant space, Freedom's Progress Colony had once offered res residents spectacular rainbows, lush marshlands, and stunning mountain ranges. Its potential as an agricultural settlement and tourism wonderland rivaled that of any Alliance colony. We've been to Freedom's Progress before. Holy, there's a lot of planets. Hastrum. Before the Geth Revolt 300 years ago, the Quarians colonized Hastrum to study the mysterious instability of its sun, which threatened premature eruption into a red giant. As a scientific outpost of minimal military value, Hastrum was ill-equipped to repel Geth forces during the insurrection and quickly fell under their control. Captured Geth planetary survey data indicates that despite sustaining damage, Hastrum's, or Hastrum's architecture remains as it was before the war, preserving a Quarian architectural style that no longer exists anywhere in the galaxy. Because Hastrum's sun was overwhelmed with the planet's protective magnetosphere, Humans foolhardily enough to venture into Geth-controlled Hastrum must exercise extreme caution. Minutes of radiation exposure will overload shields and hours of exposure will kill. Furthermore, solar output renders surface-to-orbit communications nearly impossible. No thank you. Ilium, a regional hub of Asari commerce awash in riches, Ilium is infamous for its abusive labor practices and legalizations of nearly everything except murder. As such, Ilium is the preferred production site for weapons and pharmaceuticals that would be illegal nearly everywhere else, made even more lucrative by legal indentured servitude. Among the biotics-related uh, pharmaceutical producers is the Dantius Corporation, a rising star in galactic commerce. Despite the dangers of its products, Ilium is renowned for glamour, luxury, and safety provided by near-total surveillance, making it a favored tourist destination. Countless celebrities maintain palatial estates on Ilium, and in and in its capital, Nosastra, the sole obstacle to business on Ilium is its extensive bureaucracy, tolerated only for its provision of security. Regardless of the character of its economy, Ilium's self-congratulatory media exalts its own society with the provincial arrogance of new money. 
glorifying in sexiest CEOs and 10 richest residents lists. Okay, so it's just like here. Ilos. Like the ancient human city of Troy, Ilos is a uh, world known only through secondhand sources. References to Ilos have been found at several other Prothean runes, though direct study of the world is unlikely to occur. Ilos lies in a remote area of the Terminus systems, only accessible by the legendary Mu Relay. 4,000 years ago, the Mu Relay was knocked out of position by a supernova and lost. Since then, Ilos and its clusters have been inaccessible. Occasionally, a university will organize an expedition to chart a route to Ilos during conventional FTL drive. These never get beyond the planning stages due to the distance and danger. The journey could take years or decades, passing through the hostile Terminus systems and dozens of unexplored other systems. Corliss. Known as the Starcraft Cemetery, Corliss was the regional toxic junkyard for centuries. Ships reaching astronautical near-death at connecting mass relays were sent to Corliss, stripped of every useful component, then dumped planetward to clear shipping lanes. Currently, Corliss hosts numerous Merc factions, such as the Blue... I was going to say, this would be perfect for the Mercs. Uh, <laughs> such as the Blue Suns, rumored to be using downed ship fossils to test advanced munitions. Massive gun batteries threaten anyone attempting planet fall and minimal defenses against ground attack. Because ancient volcanism greenhoused the planet, Corliss was too hot and CO2 rich to develop a biosphere despite the abundant lakes that could have sponsored the development of life. Now cool enough for protected habitation, but too scorching for anyone but extremophiles and mercenaries seeking secrecy, Corliss supports numerous Krogan outposts. Uh, supports numerous Krogan outposts. The Krogan have therefore seeded Corliss with handy, hardy Varen, often kept as warhounds. Varen live primarily on a diet of geophagous vermin and each other. That's good. Note to self, don't go to Corliss. Novaria. Novaria is a cool rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. A privately owned or privately charted colony world, the planet is owned by the Novaria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high-technology development firms and administered by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Novaria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Novaria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from council law. By special arrangement, Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Novaria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. I like it. Omega. We know a little bit about it, but let's go through it. Originally an asteroid rich in element zero, Omega was briefly mined by the Protheans, who eventually abandoned it due to its thick, impenetrable crust. Thousands of years later, nature did what even the Protheans could not. A collision with another asteroid broke Omega in half, exposing its trove of element zero for easy mining. A rush ensued as corporations and private individuals tried to strike it rich on Omega, and thieves and outlaws followed in their wake. As space became tight, construction of processing facilities extended vertically from the asteroid, creating Omega's jellyfish-like silhouette. To prevent future collisions, the station is ringed with enormous Mass Effect field generators that redirect incoming debris. Today, Omega is a major hub of narcotics, weapons, and ESO trafficking without even a pretense of civilian government or military control. Only mercenary groups have been able to instill a limited order. The most most ruthless is Nasari Syndicate, run by the notorious Arya Talok, who we know personally. Pragia, choked by the hypergrowth of non-native non plant species, Pragia serves as a galactic reminder about the imperative for careful regulation during colonization. Two centuries ago, Batarian agribusiness chose uninhabited Pragia as their empire's breadbasket. Colonization authorities introduced non-native industrial mutated plants that flourished in the world's fertile volcanic soil. Synergizing with Pragia's natural geothermal conditions and chemotropic microbes, the imported species soon became a nightmare. Mutant strains of poisonous and even carnivorous plants arose, overgrowing colonies in days instead of years, and causing the Batarians to abandon their holdings. Because the planet's small animal population is insufficient to check its plant growth, Alliance ecologists predict soil exhaustion in roughly 400 years. 
Due to its relative isolation and lack of population, Pragia has become a regional haven for drug runners, weapon smugglers, pirates, mercenaries, terrorists, and intelligence agents seeking secrecy. Rakana, the Drell homeworld of Rakana, once teemed with life, its arid plains home to spectacular insect and reptile analogs. But the Drell took to industrialization early and did not realize the extent of the environment damage they caused until it was too late. With their topsoil depleted and oceans too acidic to sustain life, the Drell were situated for a massive population crash by 2025 CE. It was then the Hanar stepped in, mounting a large-scale rescue operation to bring Drell to the Hanar homeworld, Kaje. As wars erupted over what resources remained on Rakana and billions began to die, approximately 375,000 Drell escaped in the exodus. To repay their debt, the Drell entered into an agreement with the Hanar. Called the Compact, it states that the Drell would assist the Hanar with tasks that Hanar cannot physically perform. Today, high-ranking Hanar are often inseparable from their Drell attendants. Sanctum. Sanctum is known for the freezing ice storms which sweep across its poles and temperate zones with only a thin strip of habitable land across the, or along the equator. Because of those harsh living conditions, Sanctum attracts only the most gruff and hardy from miners and mercenaries or miners to mercenaries to company men. Mining referred to as ice cracking uh, anywhere but the equator is the backbone of Sanctum's economy. The planet is rich in platinum and palladium deposits as well as boron which is locally used in semiconductor doping. Sanctum's corporate factions have learned that Cerberus is involved in the planet's finances. Systems Alliance intelligence agents embedded within the corporate strata are quietly urging the companies to confront Cerberus directly. But so far, financial bickering has kept Sanctum's major stakeholders from acting against the elusive man. The Terminus Systems. Terminus Systems are located in the far side of the Attican Traverse, beyond the space administered by the Citadel Council or claimed by the Human Systems Alliance. It is populated by a loose affiliation of minor species, united only in their refusal to acknowledge the political authority of the Council or adhere to the Citadel Conventions. Their independence comes at a price. The Terminus is fraught with conflict. War among these various species is common, as governments and dictators constantly rise and fall, the region is a haven for illegal activities, particularly piracy and the slave trade. At least once a year, a fleet from Terminus invades the nearby Attican Traverse. These attacks are typically small raids against poorly defended colonies. The Council rarely retaliates, as sending patrols into the Terminus systems could unify the disparate species against their common foe, triggering a long and costly war. The Migrant Fleet Okay, the, the uh, flotilla, or the migrant fleet, is a fleet of roughly 50,000 starships that houses over 17 million quarians, the largest galaxy of star-faring vessels in the galaxy. The fleet is so large it may take days for all the ships to pass through a mass relay. The ships are constantly repaired, replaced, and upgraded to comfortably house as many quarians as possible. Typically, the ships specialize in roles in the for the fleet, from the enormous agricultural live ships to the shielded lab ships to the repurposed freighters known as home ships that house quarian children, young parents, and educators. Employed quarians typically live in the ship they work on, since commuting from ship to ship ties up resources with unnecessary docking procedures. Even within the flotilla, quarians on most ships will remain encased in their protective suits. Rarely, quarians will meet on clean ships for specific purposes such as medical services or reproduction. When this occurs, they remove their suits, knowing full well that it is likely they will spend a few days having allergic reactions or getting over infections as the weakened immune systems compensate for each other's presence. In the Perseus Vale, as vast in natural beauty as it is in threat, the purple and gold nebula called the Perseus Vale forms the natural border between guest space and the Terminus systems. The Vale's total opacity prevents Council Intelligence from surveying Geth activity. Theoretically, the Geth could be preparing a devastating attack against the Council, um, against which the Council would, could be defenseless, or the Geth could have died out, so that the defense budget against them could be gaining the Alliance nothing but economic ruination. Despite fears of Geth, prospectors do occasionally mount salvage ventures inside the Vale. One ended in tragedy. Using techno-mental domination, the Geth drew the team into the Vale before aiming them back as husks at the organic society that produced them. A leaked classified Spectre report claims that the Dreadnought Sovereign, commanded by ex Spectre Saren Arterius and crewed by Geth, hid near the Vale before initiating a 2183 Citadel attack. Last but not least, we have Vermeer. 
Vermeer is a lush world located on the frontier of the Attican Traverse. Its vast seas and orbital position on the inner life zone have created a wide equatorial band of humid, tropical terrain. Only the political instability of the region has impeded efforts at colonization. Many times, the, count, or the Citadel has opened negotiations to settle Vermeer with the various criminal gangs and petty dictatorships in the nearby terminus systems. All fell apart due to internal power shifts within the opposing parties. The Citadel has written off the, col off the colonization of Vermeer as impossible without significant political change. The terminus systems themselves are unlikely to ever settle Vermeer. Most lack the resources to support settlement of a virgin world, finding it more expedient to steal from their neighbors than build for themselves. Makes sense. Okay. So now we have ships and vehicles uh, on both sides, so let's start with the primary. Cerberus built the Normandy SR-2 as a second-generation version of the Alliance frigate SSV Normandy after the collectors destroyed the original. The SR-2's many alterations produced a craft nearly double the original size, requiring an even larger Tantalus drive core to compensate. Its state-of-the-art Kodiak shuttle can make landings the original Normandy could not attempt. The Enhanced Defense Intelligence, an AI known colloquially as ED, coordinates many of the ship's combat functions, assisting and even supplanting human piloting. The Alliance has recently appropriated and refurbished the SR-2. In addition to tight beam communicators, the Quantum Entanglement Communicator, QEC, provides instantaneous contact with Alliance Command. And this next one, the Kodiak, we heard a little bit about from uh, Cortez, I believe his name is. Originally created to covertly insert Alliance Marines into hostile environments, the UT-47 shuttle has since been sold to allies recovered by enemies, and had its specifications stolen by spies. In one form or another, this durable transport is now used in all corners of the galaxy. A-model Kodiaks feature a front-mounted mass accelerator cannon that can be used in an anti-vehicular role. Since the shuttle lacks proper gun ports, soldiers often open the side hatch to fire on enemies. This is discouraged in Alliance manuals since it exposes the interior to return fire. Flying the 47A during atmospheric combat requires considerable skill. The pilot must reduce the vehicle's mass for speed and handling, while maintaining enough mass to resist recoil, incoming fire, and inclement weather. More than one pilot has overstressed the Kodiak's field generator and ended up on the battlefield instead of above it. Next, we have the Normandy armor upgrade. Asari-made Solaris armor can resist even the tremendous heat and kinetic energy of starship weapons. The armor is nearly unsurpassed in strength because its central material, carbon nanotube sheets woven with diamond chemical vapor deposition, are crushed by mass effect fields into super dense layers, able to withstand extreme temperatures. That process also compensates for the diamond's brittleness. Diamond armor itself has two limiting disadvantages. First, while nanotubes and CVD diamond construction have become cheaper in recent years, it remains prohibitively expensive to coat starships or aircraft larger than fighters in Solaris material. Second, the armor must be attached to the ship's superstructure, so shock waves from massive firepower can still destroy the metals beneath the armor itself. A popular misconception holds that the diamond composition of Solaris armor gives it a sparkle. In fact, atmospheric nitrogen impurities during the super-hot forging process give the armor a metallic gray or <laughs> yellow sheen. Interesting. So diamond plating, it has its drawbacks. Cyclonic Barrier Technology, CBT, attempts to solve the higher-end limitations of traditional kinetic barriers. Traditional barriers cannot block high-level kinetic energy attacks, such as disruptor torpedoes, because torpedo mass effect fields add mass. The CBT violently slaps aside, rather than halting incoming linear force. By rotationally firing their mass effect field projectors, ships create rapidly oscillating kinetic barriers instead of static ones. Shooting through the CBT is like trying to shoot at a target inside a spinning ball. Significant drawbacks to current CBT configuration prevent its use on anything other than frigates and fighters. 
Its many high-frequency sensors and emitters require frequent maintenance and replacement. A partially damaged CBT can endanger its operator, who is surrounded by rotating mass effect fields, skewing in unpredictable directions. Fortunately, if an emitter is damaged, the CBT corrects to become a traditional shield array, a safety feature that makes it most effective during opening volleys. We're experiencing a little bit of a system glitch. We'll be right back. And we're back. Next. After the Battle of the Citadel, human and Turian volunteers spent three months clearing the station's orbit of debris. During the cleanup, the Turians secretly salvaged Sovereign's powerful main gun, along with much of the weapon's element Zero Core. Eleven months later, the Turians introduced the Thanix, a scaled-down version of the weapon. The Thanix's core is a liquid alloy of iron, uranium, and tungsten, suspended in an electromagnetic field powered by element Zero. The molten metal, accelerated to a significant fraction of the speed of light, solidifies into a projectile as it is fired, hitting targets with enough force to pierce any known shield or armor. The gun can fire reliably every five seconds. Beautiful. The weapon's relatively small size allows it to be mounted on most fighters or frigates. It is now widely used by the Alliance military and is the primary weapon on the refurbished Normandy SR-2. Okay, ships and vehicles primary part done. Let's go ships and vehicles secondary. FTL drive. Faster than light drives use element zero cores to reduce the mass of the ship, allowing higher rates of acceleration. This effectively raises the speed of light within the mass effect field, allowing higher speed travel with negligible relativistic time dilation effects. Starships still require conventional thrusters, chemical rockets, commercial fusion torch, economy ion engine, or military anti-proton drive, in addition to the FTL drive core. With only a core, a ship has no motive power. The amount of ESO and power required for a drive increases exponentially to the mass being moved and the degree it is being lightened. Very massive ships or very high speeds are prohibitively expensive. If the field collapses while the ship is moving at faster than light speed, the effects are catastrophic. The ship is snapped back to sublight velocity, the enormous excess energy shed in the form of lethal Karenkov radiation. Note to self. Military ship classifications. Larger warships are generally classified in one of four weights. Frigates are small, fast ships used for scouting and screening larger vessels. Frigates often operate in wolf pack flotillas. Cruisers are middleweight combatants faster than dreadnoughts and more heavily armed than frigates. Cruisers of the standard patrol unit often lead frigate flotillas. Dreadnoughts are kilometer long capital ships mounting heavy long range firepower. They are only deployed for the most vital missions and carriers are dreadnought sized vessels that also carry a large number of freighters. Smaller vessels are almost exclusively used in a support role to the warships during combat. Fighters are one-man craft used to perform close-range attacks on enemy ships, and interceptors are one-man craft optimized for destroying opposing firefighters. The Normandy SR-1. The SSV Normandy SR-1 was a prototype starship developed by the Human Systems Alliance with assistance from the Citadel Council. The ship employed state-of-the-art de stealth technology for reconnaissance and dangerous missions. Most ships emit heat that is easy to detect against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, could temporarily shut its waste or temporarily store its waste heat deep within the hull, allowing the ship to travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert operation. This was not without risk. Eventually, the stored heat had to be released and it would build to levels that could cook the crew alive. Another key component of the Normandy stealth system was the revolutionary Tantalus drive a mass effect core twice the size of a standard unit. The Tantalus drive generated mass concentrations that the Normandy fell into, allowing it to move without the use of heat emitting thrusters. The Normandy SR-1 was destroyed in 2183 when it was ambushed by a collector ship in the Omega Nebula. Space combat. Shells lofted by surface navies crash back to Earth when the acceleration is overwhelmed by gravity and air resistance. In space, a projectile has unlimited range. It will keep moving until it hits something. Practical gunnery range is determined by the velocity of the attacker's ordnance and the maneuverability of the target. Beyond a certain range, a small ship's ability to dodge trumps a larger sh attacker's projectile speed. The longest range combat occurs between dreadnoughts, whose projectiles have the highest velocity but are the least maneuverable. The shortest range combat is between frigates, which have the slowest project projectile velocities and highest maneuverability. 
Opposing Dreadnoughts open with a main gun artillery duel at extreme ranges of tens of thousands of kilometers. The fleets close, uh, maintaining evasive lateral motion while keeping their bow guns facing the enemy. Fighters are launched and attempt to close to disruptor torpedo range. Cautious admirables, admirals uh, weaken the enemy with range fire and fighter strikes before committing to close range action. Aggressive commanders advance so cruisers and frigates can engage. At long range, the main guns of cruisers become useful. Friendly interceptors engage enemy fighters until the attackers enter the range of the ship-based guardian fire. Dreadnoughts fire from the rear screen by smaller ships. Commanders must decide whether to commit to a general melee or retreat into FDL. At medium range, ships can use broadside guns. Fleets intermingle and it becomes difficult to retreat in order. Ships with damaged kinetic barriers are vulnerable to wolf pack frigate flotillas that speed through the battle space. Only fighters and frigates enter close knife fight ranges of 10 or fewer kilometers. Fighters lose their... Fighters lose their disruptor torpedoes, uh, bringing down a ship's kinetic barriers and allowing it to be swarmed by frigates. Guardian lasers become viable weapons, swatting down fighters and boiling away warship armor. Neither dreadnoughts nor cruisers can use their main guns at close range. Laying the bow on a moving target becomes... Or laying the bow on a moving target becomes impossible. Superheater thrusters exhaust becomes a hazard. Okay, cool. So that is uh, all the way up to ships and vehicles. I think the next one we may be able to cover off the remainder, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see you guys then. Bye.